Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Jim Jordan alongside Jason Shepard. Loaded guest lineup today. Jim or Fredette breaking down basketball. We now bring in for the final Maddich Monday of this college football season, Trevor Maddich of ESPN, college football national champion with the BYU Cougars. Trevor, welcome back to the program on this national championship Monday. It's great to be back, guys. It's a culmination of a, of a long season that's had tremendous drama in every way. This game tonight between Michigan and Washington is going to be fantastic. It's going to be fun. We'll ask you about it in just a moment. Let's talk BYU first. Uh, your old position at BYU, the offensive line, has hired a new coach in TJ Woods. What do you make of this hire, and what impact do you think he could have? I, I love this hire. I think this is as close to a home run hire as they could have made at that position. He, coach Woods has made every offensive line he's coached better. At Western Kentucky, the yards per carry went way up. The sacks went way down. At UNLV, he coached two consecutive 1,000-yard rushers, and his line was blocking for them. And it was two different guys, one Aiden Robbins, who then transferred to BYU. And at Wisconsin, he coached an offensive line in front of running back Melvin Gordon, who became one of the most storied statistical running backs in NCAA history. And so he, he's got the track record. The fruit is on the tree for improvement and immediate improvement. And part of the reason for that is that he's known as a technician. He teaches the techniques of how to play offensive line, the footwork, the hand placement, all those different things. What do you do when, when things go wrong and the defender gets the upper hand on you? How do you reset? How do you respond and adjust? These are things that he is known to excel at. And I think that's part of the reasons why you've had some key offensive linemen return to BYU this year instead of transferring out to be coached by this guy because I think he'll make these alignment not just better college players. He'll prepare them for the NFL in ways that, that are important. Trevor, BYU picked up a, a big four-star uh, recruit, a safety, over the weekend. So everyone's kind of talking about some of the recruiting stuff. And uh, according to 24-7 uh, Sports, BYU had the number seven or currently has the number seven recruiting class among all Big 12 teams. And we did double check. That's including all of the new schools that are coming in this upcoming season. Now, what do you make of that? Seventh overall in the Big 12, is that good enough, do you think? Yeah, I think in the, in the first, uh, after the first full season in the Big 12, I think it's fantastic. When you look at the trajectory of it, I mean, if you take a look at these teams in the Big 12 now, and last year's recruiting rankings, I think BYU would have been 12th. And so they, they moved up, and they're still not fully ramped up with all the relationships that they will continue to develop in the Big 12 footprint with high school coaches. So I, th I think it's terrific. And plus, Coach Satake has been very clear that his first priority with players is that they be a good fit for the program and the program be a good fit for them. That this has always been a, a team that has excelled when the the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And that's, that is when players understand all of the things that make BYU a destination, not just NIL money, not just an opportunity to play right away. And so Coach Satake and his staff have been emphasizing that. And I think that the, the recruiting ranking is great from a standpoint of what it was last year, how they've improved on it, how they will continue to improve on the ranking. But the kind of player that they're bringing in, I think, is even more important. To that end, is BYU sort of in the Kansas State, Iowa State space of – we hope to be consistently good, and occasionally we're going to have that one year like Kansas State had last year winning the Big 12. Or does BYU need to get the NIL money to attract certain kind of talent to get to the level where they are competing for Big 12 championships? Can they do it as is over the next couple of years, or do they need that money at some point to get to the next level? Oh, they need mo both. And w without the money, then they'll have a ceiling because they won't be able to get as many – of the high-end talented players that they'll need to make plays, the playmakers, you need those guys to compete at the highest level. And because of the economic powerhouse that the I-15 corridor is, there, there's no reason in the world why that can't continue to grow. But I see that as something that is, is a synergy with the kind of player that they want to bring in. It's not just that, okay, well, we can only get that, that BYU kind of guy who's coachable and he's got that kind of moral character. If it were only that, they could be a competitive program. But by harnessing it also to the NIL potential of that corridor, I think that you've got a, a potential for BYU to have, once again, the synergy to give them edges in, in recruiting. And this year, they have beaten other Power 5 teams 
for a number of recruits, and that's something that used to be very, very rare. Well, the transfer portal is still alive and well, and uh, it's going to be around for the foreseeable future, to say the very least. Uh, is there a position or maybe positions that you would like to see BYU still address between now and the start of the season? Yeah, there, there are several that they could. One is running backs. It's Aiden Robbins is announced for the NFL. L.J. Martin's terrific, but he was banged up. Last year, it would be good to have uh, additional depth there. Hinkley Rapati uh, is coming off an injury, terrific running back, but I think I think depth there to replace Robbins would be important. And they've got other guys, Miles Davis, by the way, I'm very excited to see because he's a former receiver. And if he's able to show the coaches that, that he has maximized his potential at both running back and as a receiver, then from a personnel grouping standpoint, they've got some interesting things. But I would still bring in uh, some depth there. They always need more depth on the defensive line. Big guys who can run and who can rush the passers. So that also includes linebackers as well. But they, they, Tyler Batty coming back and others coming back uh, is, is a huge boon. But they need to take a big step up in depth at the defensive line. And then with Eddie Heckard moving on at uh, corner, their, their, their secondary actually has a chance to be very, very good again this year. But to replace Eddie Heckard with another cover guy, you can't have too many cover guys because it just gives you too many opportunities to do things up near the line of scrimmage if you've got individuals that can run with all four or five receivers that could come out uh, uh, could, could come out into the pass pattern. So these are some positions that I think that they could add depth and, if possible, add a guy that could be more than just depth. After last offseason, uh, a lot of BYU guys transferred. They brought, BYU brought a lot of guys in. Uh, it was about half the roster was turned over. This year, there's not that kind of turnover. There's more continuity going into this year. BYU's not gone to the portal a ton quite yet. Perhaps they will later. They've signed a big class, many of which are, you know, are, some are going on missions, but a lot will actually come in and, and compete right away. What do you make of sort of the roster makeup going into year two of the Big 12? I like it. I like that they have brought in some key transfers, but at the same time, a place like BYU is a place that people tend to want to stay. I mean, they, that last year they had a bunch of guys transfer out. Part of the reason was playing time. There were other reasons in terms of fit. But overall, if the fit is right, I think people will tend to stay at BYU. And then developing a program where you've got guys in the program for three, four years, five years even, is another thing that would be an advantage for BYU. And I think the fact that they had very few guys transfer out this year, certainly very few key contributors, uh, is an indication that those guys see that BYU is a place that they want to be and they want to make a home for their college football life and their, their academic life. And so I like it that it's primarily high school recruits with some key junior college transfers, some key transfer portal guys. But over the course of time, if they're able to maintain that, it will mean they'll be able to field more experienced players who have played together under this staff longer. Trevor, the, the decline of bowl games has been pretty evident over the last couple of years. And now with the transfer portal, you know, you, you had always in the last couple of years, you'd have guys that would, I mean, if they're going to go to the NFL, you know, they're, they're not going to, they don't want to play and they're going to sit out. With the transfer portal, you're seeing even more and more guys that are not participating in teams' bowl games. Is, is there any way to salvage what bowl games used to mean if you're something that's not, if you're outside of the college football playoff? Or is, that, is this just the new reality? It's the new reality, Jason, because the calendar has conspired to force guys into the portal maybe sooner than they would want to go. I mean, if you wait too long because you want to play with a bowl game, especially the bowl games that are later in December, then you enter the portal, you'd have to find a new home, which a lot of guys don't even find a new home. And then you've got to somehow get enrolled in some of these places in, in early January. And that enrollment for the next semester is the thing that kind of squeezes them on the back end. Plus, we know that there are a lot of players that are still in the portal that entered it last year. They never did find a home. And so what you don't want to do is we have a ball game at the end of December and a bunch of other guys in my position just entered the transfer portal weeks before I'm going to if I play in the bowl game. And 
maybe they'll fill up the slots at schools that I might want to go to. Now, there are some guys this year that, that played in their bowl, even though they were in the transfer portal, but that's kind of a rarity. So I, I don't blame the players for doing that. I don't think they disrespect the bowls for doing that. I think the calendar forces them to. But from a fan standpoint, you don't get to see some of the players that you saw play all year for your team. But what you are getting to see is next year's players come in and get an early look at them, and they will have a chance to get valuable experience for next year. So th there's bad, but there's also good. It just depends on your perspective. Okay, Michigan and Washington tonight in the national championship. Who you got and why? This is a tough call, Jeremy. It's, it's a really tough call. Uh, and uh, who I have is Michigan. I have them to win. And I ha the why is that they've got more ways to win. This is really a, a matter of styles where there's there's always this this hypothetical talk of a of a boxing match between Mike Tyson and Muhammad Ali in their prime. You know, Michigan is Mike Tyson, where he, they just march right up to you and start punching you in the face until you submit. Washington is like Ali, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, this beautiful downfield passing attack. But that downfield passing attack is the way they need to win. Michigan will run the ball better. Michigan will play better defense. Washington's defense has been bend but break sometimes, don't break other times, stop drives because of takeaways and forcing mistakes. But Michigan is one of the most clean playing offenses in college football in terms of fewest, fewest uh, turnovers, fewest penalties, things like that. I don't know that Washington will be able to force as much against the Michigan offense as they have in the past against other offenses. And so Michigan will be able to run the ball. They'll be able to stop the run. That core, I think, will be enough for Michigan to pull away late. Plus, Michael Penix Jr., the quarterback for Washington, was just lights out against Texas, especially under pressure. I mean, Texas didn't sack him, but they had 16 pressures. On those pressures, Penix was 60%, averaging 10 yards per attempt. That's incredible. Can he do that again? Because his season average under pressure is 45%. And so it, it'll be an interesting thing to see if Washington can still play at that super high level against Michigan for the second game in a row. Maybe they can. Certainly they've got the talent to do a lot of things and have a puncher's chance with that passing attack. But I've got to take Michigan as the team that has more fundamental ways to win this game.